I had not decided, the doctor said, turning the brandy in his glass, how best to prepare the three of you for Hill House. I certainly could not write you about it, and I am most unwilling now to influence your minds with its complete history before you have had a chance to see for yourselves. They were back in the small parlour, warm and almost sleepy. Theodora had abandoned any attempt at a chair and had put herself down on the hearthrug, cross-legged and drowsy. Eleanor, wanting to sit on the hearthrug beside her, had not thought of it in time and had condemned herself to one of the slippery chairs, unwilling now to attract attention by moving and getting herself awkwardly down onto the floor. Mrs. Dudley's good dinner and an hour's quiet conversation had evaporated the faint air of unreality and constraint. They had begun to know one another, recognise individual voices and mannerisms, faces and laughter. Eleanor thought, with a little shock of surprise, that she had been in Hill House only for four or five hours and smiled a little at the fire. She could feel the thin stem of her glass between her fingers, the stiff pressure of the chair against her back, the faint movements of air through the room which were barely perceptible in small stirrings of tassels and beads. Darkness lay in the corners, and the marble Cupid smiled down on them with chubby good humour. "'What a time for a ghost story,' Theodora said. "'If you please,' the doctor was stiff. "'We are not children trying to frighten one another.' he said. Sorry, Theodora smiled up at him. I'm just trying to get myself used to all of this. Let us, said the doctor, exercise great caution in our language. Preconceived notions of ghosts and apparitions. The disembodied hand and the soup, Luke said helpfully. My dear boy, if you please, I was trying to explain that our purpose here, since it is of a scientific and exploratory nature, ought not to be affected, perhaps even warped, by half-remembered spooky stories which belong more properly to a... Let me see. A marshmallow roast? Pleased with himself, he looked around to be sure they were all amused. As a matter of fact, my researches over the past few years have led me to certain theories regarding psychic phenomena which I have now, for the first time, an opportunity of testing. Ideally, of course, you ought not to know anything about Hill House. You should be ignorant and receptive. And take notes, Theodora murmured. Notes, yes, indeed, notes. However, I realise that it is most impractical to leave you entirely without background information, largely because you are not people accustomed to meeting a situation without preparation. He beamed at them slyly. You are three willful, spoiled children who are prepared to nag me for your bedtime story. Theodora giggled and the doctor nodded at her happily. He rose and moved to stand by the fire in an unmistakable classroom pose. He seemed to feel the lack of a blackboard behind him, because once or twice he half-turned, hand-raised, as though looking for chalk to illustrate a point. Now, he said, we will take up the history of Hill House. I wish I had a notebook and a pen, Eleanor thought, just to make him feel at home. She glanced at Theodora and Luke and found both their faces fallen instinctively into a completely rapt classroom look. High earnestness, she thought. We have moved into another stage of our adventure. You will recall, the doctor began, the houses described in Leviticus as leprous, saras, or Homer's phrase for the underworld, a deo domus, the house of Hades. I need not remind you, I think, that the concept of certain houses as unclean or forbidden, perhaps sacred, is as old as the mind of man. Certainly there are spots which inevitably attach to themselves an atmosphere of holiness and goodness, it might not then be too fanciful to say that some houses are born bad. Hill House, whatever the cause, has been unfit for human habitation for upwards of twenty years. What it was like before then, whether its personality was moulded by the people who lived here, or the things they did, or whether it was evil from the start, are all questions I cannot answer. Naturally, I hope that we will all know a good deal more about Hill House before we leave. No one knows even why some houses are called haunted. What else could you call Hill House? Luke demanded. Well, disturbed, perhaps. Leprous. Sick. Any of the popular euphemisms for insanity. A deranged house is a pretty conceit. There are popular theories, however, which discount the eerie, the mysterious. There are people who will tell you that the disturbances I am calling psychic are actually the result of subterranean waters or electric currents or hallucinations caused by polluted air. Atmospheric pressure, sunspots, earth tremors all have their advocates among the sceptical. P. 
people, the doctor said sadly, are always so anxious to get things out into the open where they can put a name to them, even a meaningless name, so long as it has something of a scientific ring. He sighed, relaxing, and gave them a quizzical smile. A haunted house, he said. Everyone laughs. I found myself telling my colleagues at the university that I was going camping this summer. I told people I was participating in a scientific experiment, Theodora said helpfully, without telling them where or what, of course. Presumably your friends feel less strongly about scientific experiments than mine. Yes, the doctor sighed again. Camping, at my age. And yet that they believed well. He straightened up again and fumbled at his side, perhaps, for a yardstick. I first heard about Hill House a year ago from a former tenant. He began by assuring me that he had left Hill House because his family objected to living so far out in the country, and ended by saying that, in his opinion, the house ought to be burned down and the ground sowed with salt. I learned of other people who had rented Hill House and found that none of them had stayed more than a few days, certainly never the full terms of their leases, giving reasons that range from the dampness of the location, not at all true, by the way, the house is very dry, to a pressing need to move elsewhere for business reasons. That is, every tenant who has left Hill House hastily has made an effort to supply a rational reason for leaving, and yet every one of them has left. I tried, of course, to learn more from these former tenants, and yet in no case could I persuade them to discuss the house. They all seemed most unwilling to give me information, and were, in fact, reluctant to recall the details of their several stays. In only one opinion were they united. Without exception, every person who has spent any length of time in this house urged me to stay as far away from it as possible. Not one of the former tenants could bring himself to admit that Hill House was haunted, but when I visited Hillsdale and looked up the newspaper records... Newspapers? Theodore asked. Was there a scandal? Oh, yes, the doctor said. The perfectly splendid scandal with a suicide and madness and lawsuits. Then I learned that the local people had no doubts about the house. I heard a dozen different stories, of course. It is really unbelievably difficult to get accurate information about a haunted house. It would astonish you to know what I have gone through to learn only as much as I have, and, as a result, I went to Mrs. Sanderson, Luke's aunt, and arranged to rent Hill House. She was most frank about its undesirability. It's harder to burn down a house than you think, Luke said, but agreed to allow me a short lease to carry out my researches on condition that a member of the family be one of my party. They hope, Luke said solemnly, that I will dissuade you from digging up the lovely old scandals. There. Now I have explained how I happen to be here and why Luke has come. As for you two ladies, we all know by now that you are here because I wrote you and you accepted my invitation. I hoped that each of you might, in her own way, intensify the forces at work in the house. Theodora has shown herself possessed of some telepathic ability, and Eleanor has in the past been intimately involved in poltergeist phenomena. I? Of course. The doctor looked at her curiously. Many years ago, when you were a child, the stones. Eleanor frowned and shook her head. Her fingers trembled around the stem of her glass, and then she said, That was the neighbours. My mother said the neighbours did that. People are always jealous. Perhaps so, the doctor spoke quietly and smiled at Eleanor. The incident has been forgotten long ago, of course. I only mentioned it because that is why I wanted you in Hill House. When I was a child, Theodora said lazily, many years ago, doctor, as you put it so tactfully, I was whipped for throwing a brick through a greenhouse roof. I remember I thought about it for a long time, remembering the whipping, but remembering also the lovely crash, and after thinking about it very seriously, I went out and did it again. I don't remember very well, Eleanor said uncertainly to the doctor. But why? Theodora asked. I mean, I can accept that Hill House is supposed to be haunted, and you want us here, Dr. Montague, to help keep track of what happens, and I bet besides that you wouldn't at all like being here alone. But I just don't understand. It's a horrible old house, and if I rented it, I'd scream for my money back after one fast look at the front hall. But what's here? What really frightens people so? I will not put a name to what has no name, the doctor said. I don't know. They never even told me what was going on, Eleanor said urgently to the doctor. My mother said it was the neighbours. They were always against us because she wouldn't mix with them. My mother... Luke interrupted her slowly and deliberately. I think, he said that what we all want is facts, something we can understand and put together. First, the doctor said, I'm going to ask you all a question. 
Do you want to leave? Do you advise that we pack up now and leave Hill House to itself and never have anything more to do with it? He looked at Eleanor. Eleanor put her hands together tight. It is another chance to get away, she was thinking, and she said no, and glanced with embarrassment at Theodora. I was kind of a baby this afternoon, she explained. I did let myself get frightened. She's not telling all the truth, Theodora said loyally. She wasn't any more frightened than I was. We scared each other to death over a rabbit. Horrible creatures, rabbits, Luke said. The doctor laughed. I suppose we were all nervous this afternoon anyway. It is a rude shock to turn that corner and get a clear look at Hill House. I thought he was going to send the car into a tree, Luke said. I'm really very brave now in a warm room with a fire and company, Theodora said. I don't think we could leave now if we wanted to. Eleanor had spoken before she realised clearly what she was going to say, or what it was going to sound like to the others. She saw that they were staring at her, and laughed, and added lamely, Mrs Dudley would never forgive us. She wondered if they really believed that that was what she had meant to say, and thought, perhaps it has us now, this house. Perhaps it will not let us go. Let us have a little more brandy, the doctor said, and I will tell you the story of Hill House. He returned to his classroom position before the fireplace and began, slowly, as one giving an account of kings long dead and wars long done with. His voice was carefully unemotional. Hill House was built eighty odd years ago, he began. It was built as a home for his family by a man named Hugh Crane, a country home where he hoped to see his children and grandchildren live in comfortable luxury and where he fully expected to end his days in quiet. Unfortunately, Hill House was a sad house almost from the beginning. Hugh Crane's young wife died minutes before she first was to set eyes on the house, when the carriage bringing her here overturned in the driveway, and the lady was brought, uh, lifeless, I believe is the phrase they use, into the home her husband had built for her. He was a sad and bitter man, Hugh Crane, left with two small daughters to bring up, but he did not leave Hill House. Children grew up here? Eleanor asked incredulously. The doctor smiled. The house is dry, as I said. There were no swamps to bring them fevers. The country air was thought to be beneficial to them, and the house itself was regarded as luxurious. I have no doubt that two small children could play here, lonely perhaps, but not unhappy. I hope they went wading in the brook, Theodora said. She stared deeply into the fire. Poor little things. I hope someone let them run in that meadow and pick wild flowers. Their father married again, the doctor went on. Twice more, as a matter of fact. He seems to have been unlucky in his wives. The second Mrs. Crane died of a fall, although I've been unable to ascertain how or why. Her death seems to have been as tragically unexpected as her predecessors. The third Mrs. Crane died of what they used to call consumption, somewhere in Europe. There is, somewhere in the library, a collection of postcards sent to the two little girls left behind in Hill House from their father and their stepmother travelling from one health resort to another. The little girls were left here with their governess until their stepmother's death. After that, Hugh Crane declared his intention of closing Hill House and remaining abroad, and his daughters were sent to live with a cousin of their mother's, and there they remained until they were grown up. I hope Mama's cousin was a little jollier than old Hugh. Theodora said, still staring darkly into the fire. It's not nice to think of children growing up like mushrooms in the dark. They felt differently, the doctor said. The two sisters spent the rest of their lives quarrelling over Hill House. After all his high hopes of a dynasty centred here, Hugh Crane died somewhere in Europe shortly after his wife, and Hill House was left jointly to the two sisters, who must have been quite young ladies by then. The older sister had, at any rate, made her debut into society and put up her hair and learned to drink champagne and carry a fan. Hill House was empty for a number of years, but kept always in readiness for the family, at first in expectation of Hugh Crane's return, and then, after his death, for either of the sisters who chose to live there. Somewhere during this time it was apparently agreed between the two sisters that Hill House should become the property of the older. The younger sister had married. Aha, Theodora said. The younger sister married. Stole her sister's bow, I've no doubt. It was said that the older sister was crossed in love, the doctor agreed, although that is said of almost any lady who prefers, for whatever reason, to live alone. At any rate, it was the older sister who came back here to live. 
She seems to have resembled her father strongly. She lived here alone for a number of years, almost in seclusion, although the village of Hillsdale knew her. Incredible as it may sound to you, she genuinely loved Hill House and looked upon it as her family home. She eventually took a girl from the village to live with her as a kind of companion. So far as I can learn, there seems to have been no strong feeling among the villagers about the house then, since old Miss Crane, as she was inevitably known, hired her servants in the village, and it was thought a fine thing for her to take the village girl as a companion. Old Miss Crane was in constant disagreement with her sister over the house, the younger sister insisting that she had given up her claim on the house in exchange for a number of family heirlooms of considerable value, which her sister then refused to give her. There were some jewels, several pieces of antique furniture, and a set of gold-rimmed dishes, which seemed to irritate the younger sister more than anything else. Mrs. Sanderson let me rummage through a box of family papers, and so I have seen some of the letters Miss Crane received from her sister, and in all of them those dishes stand out as a recurrent sore subject. At any rate, the older sister died of pneumonia here in the house, with only the little companion to help her. There were stories later of a doctor called Too Late, of the old lady lying neglected upstairs while the younger woman dallied in the garden with some village lout, but I suspect that these are only scandalous inventions. I certainly cannot find that anything of the sort was widely believed at the time, and in fact most of the stories seem to stem directly from the poisonous vengefulness of the younger sister, who never rested in her anger. I don't like the younger sister, Theodora said. First she stole her sister's lover, and then she tried to steal her sister's dishes. No, I don't like her. Hill House has an impressive list of tragedies connected with it, but then most all houses have. People have to live and die somewhere, after all, and a house can hardly stand for 80 years without seeing some of its inhabitants die within its walls. After the death of the older sister, there was a lawsuit over the house. The companion insisted that the house was left to her, but the younger sister and her husband maintained most violently that the house belonged legally to them and claimed that the companion had tricked the older sister into signing away property which she had always intended leaving to her sister. It was an unpleasant business, like all family quarrels, and, as in all family quarrels, incredibly harsh and cruel things were said on either side. The companion swore in court, and here I think is the first hint of Hill House and its true personality, that the younger sister came into the house at night and stole things. When she was pressed to enlarge upon this accusation, she became very nervous and incoherent, and finally, forced to give some evidence for her charge, said that a silver service was missing and a valuable set of enamels, in addition to the famous set of gold-rimmed dishes, which would actually be a very difficult thing to steal when you think about it. For her part, the younger sister went so far as to mention murder, and demand an investigation into the death of old Miss Crane, bringing up the first hints of the stories of neglect and mismanagement. I cannot discover that these suggestions were ever taken seriously. There is no record whatever of any but the most formal notice of the older sister's death, and certainly the villagers would have been the first to wonder if there had been any oddness about the death. The companion won her case at last, and could, in my opinion, have won a case for slander besides, and the house became legally hers, although the younger sister never gave up trying to get it. She kept after the unfortunate companion with letters and threats, made the wildest accusations against her everywhere, and in the local police records there is listed at least one occasion when the companion was forced to apply for police protection to prevent her enemy from attacking her with a broom. The companion went in terror, seemingly. Her house burgled at night. She never stopped insisting that they came and stole things. And I read one pathetic letter in which she complained that she had not spent a peaceful night in the house since the death of her benefactor. Oddly enough, sympathy around the village was almost entirely with the younger sister perhaps because the companion, once a village girl, was now lady of the manor. The villagers believed, and still believe, I think, that the younger sister was defrauded of her inheritance by a scheming young woman. They did not believe that she would murder her friend, you see, but they were delighted to believe that she was dishonest, certainly because they were capable of dishonesty themselves when opportunity arose. Well, gossip is always a bad enemy. When the poor creature killed herself... Killed herself? Eleanor shocked into speech, half rose. She had to kill herself? You mean, was there another way of escaping her tormentor? She certainly did not seem to think so. It was accepted locally that she had chosen suicide because her guilty conscience drove her to it. I am more inclined to believe that she was one of those tenacious, unclever young women who can hold on desperately what they believe is their own, but cannot withstand mentally a constant nagging persecution. 
She had certainly no weapons to fight back against the younger sister's campaign of hatred. Her own friends in the village had been turned against her, and she seems to have been maddened by the conviction that locks and bolts could not keep out the enemy who stole into her house at night. She should have gone away, Eleanor said, left the house and run as far as she could go. In effect, she did. I really think the poor girl was hated to death. She hanged herself, by the way. Gossip says she hanged herself from the turret in the tower, but when you have a house like Hill House with a tower and a turret, gossip would hardly allow you to hang yourself anywhere else. After her death, the house passed legally into the hands of the Sanderson family, who were cousins of hers and in no way as vulnerable to the persecutions of the younger sister, who must have been a little demented herself by that time. I heard from Mrs. Sanderson that when the family, it would have been her husband's parents, first came to see the house, the younger sister showed up to abuse them, standing on the road to howl at them as they went by and found herself packed right off to the local police station. And that seems to be the end of the younger sister's part in the story. From the day the first Sanderson sent her packing to the brief notice of her death a few years later, she seems to have spent her time brooding silently over her wrongs, but far away from the Sandersons. Oddly enough, in all her ranting, she insisted always on one point. She had not, would not, come into this house at night to steal or for any other reason. Was anything ever really stolen? Luke asked. As I told you, the companion was finally pressed into saying that one or two things seemed to be missing— but could not say for sure. As you can imagine, the story of the nightly intruder did a good deal to enhance Hill House's further reputation. Moreover, the Sandersons did not live here at all. They spent a few days in the house, telling the villagers that they were preparing it for their immediate occupancy, and then abruptly cleared out, closing the house the way it stood. They told around the village that urgent business took them to live in the city, but the villagers thought they knew better. No one has lived in the house since for more than a few days at a time. It has been on the market for sale or rent ever since. Well, that is a long story. I need more brandy. Those two poor little girls, Eleanor said, looking into the fire. I can't forget them. Walking through these dark rooms, trying to play dolls maybe in here or those bedrooms upstairs. And so the old house has just been sitting here, Luke put out a tentative finger and touched the marble cupid gingerly. Nothing in it touched, nothing used, nothing here wanted by anyone any more, just sitting here thinking. And waiting, Eleanor said. And waiting, the doctor confirmed. Essentially, he went on slowly, the evil is the house itself, I think. It has enchained and destroyed its people and their lives. It is a place of contained ill will. Well, tomorrow we will see it all. The Sandersons put in electricity and plumbing and a telephone when they first thought to live here, but otherwise nothing has been changed. Well, Luke said after a little silence, I'm sure we will all be very comfortable here. Eleanor found herself unexpectedly admiring her own feet. Theodora dreamed over the fire just beyond the tips of her toes, and Eleanor thought with deep satisfaction that her feet were handsome in their red sandals. What a complete and separate thing I am, she thought, going from my red toes to the top of my head, individually an I, possessed of attributes belonging only to me. I have red shoes, she thought, that goes with being Eleanor. I dislike lobster and sleep on my left side and crack my knuckles when I'm nervous and save buttons. I'm holding a brandy glass, which is mine, because I am here and I am using it. And I have a place in this room. I have red shoes, and tomorrow I will wake up, and I will still be here. I have red shoes, she said very softly, and Theodora turned and smiled up at her. I had intended, and the doctor looked around at them with bright, anxious optimism, I had intended to ask if you all played bridge. Of course, Ellen said. I play bridge, she thought. I used to have a cat named Dancer. I can swim. I'm afraid not, Theodora said, and the other three turned and regarded her with frank dismay. Not at all, the doctor asked. I've been playing bridge twice a week for eleven years, Eleanor said, with my mother and her lawyer and his wife. I'm sure you must play as well as that. Maybe you could teach me, Theodora asked. I'm quick at learning games. Oh, dear the doctor said, and Eleanor and Luke laughed. We'll do something else, Eleanor said. 
I can play bridge, she thought. I like apple pie with sour cream, and I drove here by myself. Backgammon, the doctor said with bitterness. I play a fair game of chess, Luke said to the doctor, who cheered at once. Theodora set her mouth stubbornly. I didn't suppose we came here to play games, she said. Relaxation, the doctor said vaguely, and Theodora turned with a sullen shrug and stared again into the fire. I'll get the chessman if you'll tell me where, Luke said, and the doctor smiled. Better let me go, he said. I've studied a floor plan of the house, remember. If we let you go off wandering by yourself, we'd very likely never find you again. As the door closed behind him, Luke gave Theodora a quick, curious glance and then came over to stand by Eleanor. You're not nervous, are you? Did that story frighten you? Eleanor shook her head emphatically, and Luke said, You look pale. I probably ought to be in bed, Eleanor said. I'm not used to driving as far as I did today. Brandy, Luke said, make you sleep better. You too he said to the back of Theodora's head. Thank you, Theodora said coldly, not turning. I rarely have trouble sleeping. Luke grinned knowingly at Eleanor and then turned as the doctor opened the door. My wild imagination, the doctor said, setting down the chess set. What a house this is. Does something happen? Eleanor asked. The doctor shook his head. We probably ought to agree now not to wander around the house alone, he said. What happened? Eleanor asked. My own imagination, the doctor said firmly. This table all right, Luke? It's a lovely old chess set, Luke said. I wonder how the younger sister happened to overlook it. I can tell you one thing, the doctor said. If it was the younger sister sneaking around this house at night, she had nerves of iron. It watches, he added suddenly. The house. It watches every move you make. And then, my own imagination, of course. In the light of the fire, Theodora's face was stiff and sulky. She likes attention, Eleanor thought wisely, and, without thinking, moved and sat on the floor beside Theodora. Behind her she could hear the gentle sound of chessmen being set down on a board, and the comfortable small movements of Luke and the doctor taking each other's measure, and in the fire there were points of flame and little stirrings. She waited a minute for Theodora to speak, and then said agreeably, "'Still hard to believe you're really here.' I had no idea it would be so dull, Theodora said. We'll find plenty to do in the morning, Eleanor said. At home there would be people around and lots of talking and laughing and lights and excitement. I suppose I don't need such things, Eleanor said, almost apologetically. There never was much excitement for me. I had to stay with Mother, of course, and when she was asleep I kind of got used to playing solitaire or listening to the radio. I never could bear to read in the evenings because I had to read aloud to her for two hours every afternoon. Love stories. And she smiled a little, looking into the fire. But that's not all, she thought, astonished at herself. That doesn't tell what it was like, even if I wanted to tell. Why am I talking? I'm terrible, aren't I? Theodora moved quickly and put her hand over Eleanor's. I sit here and grouch because there's nothing to amuse me. I'm very selfish. Tell me how horrible I am and in the firelight her eyes shone with delight. "'You're horrible,' Eleanor said obediently. Theodora's hand on her own embarrassed her. She disliked being touched, and yet a small physical gesture seemed to be Theodora's chosen way of expressing contrition or pleasure or sympathy. "'I wonder if my fingernails are clean,' Eleanor thought, and slid her hand away gently. "'I am horrible,' Theodora said, good-humoured again. "'I'm horrible and beastly, and no one can stand me.' There. Now, tell me about yourself. I'm horrible and beastly and no one can stand me. Theodora laughed. Don't make fun of me. You're sweet and pleasant and everybody likes you very much. Luke has fallen madly in love with you and I am jealous. Now, I want to know more about you. Did you really take care of your mother for many years? Yes, Eleanor said. Her fingernails were dirty and her hand was badly shaped and the people make jokes about love because sometimes it was funny. Eleven years until she died three months ago. Were you sorry when she died? Should I say how sorry I am? No, she wasn't very happy. And neither were you. And neither was I. But what about now? What did you do afterward when you were free at last? I sold the house, Eleanor said. My sister and I each took whatever we wanted from it, small things. There was really nothing much except little things my mother had saved, my father's watch and some old jewellery. Not at all like the Sisters of Hill House. 
And you sold everything else? Everything, just as soon as I could. And then, of course, you started a gay, mad fling that brought you inevitably to Hill House. Not exactly, Eleanor laughed. But all those wasted years. Did you go on a cruise, look for exciting young men, buy new clothes? Unfortunately, Eleanor said dryly, there was not at all that much money. My sister put her share into the bank for her little girl's education. I did buy some clothes to come to Hill House. People like answering questions about themselves, she thought. What an odd pleasure it is. I would answer anything right now. What will you do when you go back? Do you have a job? No, no job right now. I don't know what I'm going to do. I know what I'll do, Theodora stretched luxuriously. I'll turn on every light in our apartment and just bask. What is your apartment like? Theodora shrugged. Nice, she said. We found an old place and fixed it up ourselves. One big room and a couple of small bedrooms, nice kitchen. We painted it red and white and made over a lot of old furniture we dug up in junk shops. One really nice table with a marble top. We both love doing over old things. Are you married? Eleanor asked. There was a little silence and then Theodora laughed quickly and said, No. Sorry, Eleanor said, horribly embarrassed. I didn't mean to be curious. You're funny, Theodora said and touched Eleanor's cheek with her finger. There are lines by my eyes, Eleanor thought and turned her face away from the fire. Tell me where you live, Theodora said. Eleanor thought, looking down at her hands which were badly shaped. We could have afforded a laundress, she thought. It wasn't fair. My hands are awful. I have a little place of my own, she said slowly. An apartment, like yours, only I live alone. Smaller than yours, I'm sure. I'm still furnishing it, buying one thing at a time, you know, to make sure I get everything absolutely right. White curtains. I had to look for weeks before I found my little stone lions on each corner of the mantel, and I have a white cat in my books and records and pictures. Everything has to be exactly the way I want it, because there's only me to use it. Once I had a blue cup with stars painted on the inside. When you look down into a cup of tea, it was full of stars. I want a cup like that. Maybe one will turn up some day in my shop, Theodora said. Then I can send it to you. Some day you'll get a little package saying to Eleanor with love from her friend Theodora, and it will be a blue cup full of stars. I would have stolen those gold-rimmed dishes, Eleanor said, laughing. Mate, Luke said, and the doctor said, oh dear, oh dear. Blind luck, Luke said cheerfully. Have you ladies fallen asleep there by the fire? Just about, Theodora said. Luke came across the room and held out a hand to each of them to help them up, and Eleanor, moving awkwardly, almost fell. Theodora rose in a quick motion and stretched and yawned. Theo is sleepy, she said. I'll have to lead you upstairs, the doctor said. Tomorrow we must really start to learn our way around. Luke, will you screen the fire? How do we better make sure that the doors are locked, Luke asked. I imagine that Mrs. Dudley locked the back door when she left, but what about the others? I hardly think we'll catch anyone breaking in, Theodora said. Anyway, the little companion used to lock her doors, and what good did it do her? Suppose we want to break out, Eleanor asked. The doctor glanced quickly at Eleanor, and then away. I see no need for locking doors, he said quietly. There is certainly not much danger of burglars from the village, Luke said. In any case, the doctor said, I will not sleep for an hour or so yet. At my age, an hour's reading before bedtime is essential, and I wisely brought Pamela with me. If any of you has trouble sleeping, I will read aloud to you. I never yet knew anyone who could not fall asleep with Richardson being read aloud to him. Talking quietly, he led them down the narrow hallway and through the great front hall and to the stairs. I have often planned to try it on very small children, he went on. Eleanor followed Theodora up the stairs. She had not realized until now how worn she was, and each step was an effort. She reminded herself naggingly that she was in Hill House, but even the blue room meant only, right now, the bed with the blue coverlet and the blue quilt. On the other hand, the doctor continued behind her, a fielding novel, comparable in length, although hardly in subject matter, would never do for very young children. I even have doubts about Stern. Theodora went to the door of the green room and turned and smiled. If you feel the least bit nervous, she said to Eleanor, run right into my room. I will, Eleanor said earnestly. Thank you. Good night. And certainly not Smollett.
Ladies, Luke and I are here, on the other side of the stairway. What colour are your rooms? Eleanor asked, unable to resist. Yellow, the doctor said, surprised. Pink, Luke said with a dainty gesture of distaste. We're blue and green down here, Theodora said. I will be awake reading, the doctor said. I will leave my door ajar, so I will certainly hear any sound. Good night. Sleep well. Good night, Luke said. Good night, all. As she closed the door of the blue room behind her, Eleanor thought wearily that it might be the darkness and the oppression of Hill House that tired her so, and then it no longer mattered. The blue bed was unbelievably soft. Odd, she thought sleepily, that the house should be so dreadful and yet in many respects so physically comfortable. The soft bed, the pleasant lawn, the good fire, the cooking of Mrs. Dudley. The company, too, she thought, and then thought, now I can think about them. I'm all alone. Why is Luke here? But why am I here? Journeys end in lovers' meeting. They all saw that I was afraid. She shivered and sat up in bed to reach for the quilt at the foot. Then, half amused and half cold, she slipped out of bed and went, barefoot and silent, across the room to turn the key in the lock of the door. They won't know I locked it, she thought, and went hastily back to bed. With the quilt pulled up around her, she found herself looking with quick apprehension at the window, shining palely in the darkness, and then at the door. I wish I had a sleeping pill to take, she thought, and looked again over her shoulder, compulsively at the window, and then again at the door, and thought, Is it moving? But I locked it. Is it moving? I think, she decided concretely, that I would like this better if I had the blankets over my head. Hidden deep in the bed under the blanket, she giggled and was glad none of the others could hear her. In the city, she never slept with her head under the covers. I have come all this way today, she thought. Then she slept, secure. In the next room, Theodora slept, smiling with her light on. Farther down the hall, the doctor, reading Pamela, lifted his head occasionally to listen and once went to his door and stood for a minute, looking down the hall before going back to his book. A nightlight shone at the top of the stairs over the pool of blackness which was the hall. Luke slept, on his bedside table a flashlight and the lucky piece he always carried with him. Around them the house brooded, settling and stirring with a movement that was almost like a shudder. Six miles away, Mrs. Dudley awakened, looked at her clock, thought of Hill House, and shut her eyes quickly. Mrs. Gloria Sanderson, who owned Hill House and lived three hundred miles away from it, closed her detective story, yawned, and reached up to turn off her light, wondering briefly if she had remembered to put the chain on the front door. Theodora's friend slept. So did the doctor's wife and Eleanor's sister. Far away, in the trees over Hill House, an owl cried out, and toward morning a thin, fine rain began, misty and dull. Eleanor awakened to find the blue room grey and colourless in the morning rain. She found that she had thrown the quilt off during the night and had finished sleeping in her usual manner with her head on the pillow. It was a surprise to find that she had slept until after eight, and she thought that it was ironic that the first good night's sleep she had had in years had come to her in Hill House. Lying in the blue bed, looking up into the dim ceiling with its remote carved pattern, she asked herself, half asleep still, what did I do? Did I make a fool of myself? Were they laughing at me? Thinking quickly over the evening before, she could remember only that she had, must have, seemed foolishly, childishly contented, almost happy. Had the others been amused to see that she was so simple? I said silly things, she told herself, and of course they noticed. Today I will be more reserved, less openly grateful to all of them for having me. Then, awakening completely, she shook her head and sighed. You are a very silly baby, Eleanor, she told herself, as she did every morning. The room came clearly alive around her. She was in the blue room at Hill House. The dimity curtains were moving slightly at the window, and the wild splashing in the bathroom must be Theodora, awake, sure to be dressed and ready for her, certain to be hungry. Good morning, Eleanor called, and Theodora answering, gasping, Good morning. Through in a minute. I'll leave the tub filled for you. Are you starving? Because I am. Does she think I wouldn't bathe unless she left a full tub for me? Eleanor wondered, and then was ashamed. 
I came here to stop thinking things like that, she told herself sternly, and rolled out of bed and went to the window. She looked out across the veranda roof to the wide lawn below, with its bushes and little clumps of trees wound around with mist. Far down at the end of the lawn was the line of trees which marked the path to the creek, although the prospect of a jolly picnic on the grass was not this morning so appealing. It was clearly going to be wet all day, but it was a summer rain, deepening the green of the grass and the trees, sweetening and cleaning the air. It's charming, Eleanor thought, surprised at herself, and wondered if she was the first person ever to find Hill House charming, and then thought, chilled, or do they all think so the first morning? She shivered, and found herself at the same time unable to account for the excitement she felt, which made it difficult to remember why it was so odd to wake up happy in Hill House. I'll starve to death, Theodora pounded on the bathroom door, and Eleanor snatched at her robe and hurried. Try to look like a stray sunbeam, Theodora called out from her room. It's such a dark day, we've got to be a little brighter than usual. Sing before breakfast, you'll cry before night, Eleanor told herself, because she had been singing softly. In delay there lies no plenty. I thought I was the lazy one, Theodora said complacently through the door, but you're much, much worse. Lazy hardly begins to describe you. You must be clean enough now to come and have breakfast. Mrs. Dudley sets out breakfast at nine. What will she think when we show up bright and smiling? She will sob with disappointment. Did anyone scream for her in the night, do you suppose? Eleanor regarded a soapy leg critically. I slept like a log, she said. So did I. If you are not ready in three minutes, I will come in and drown you. I want my breakfast. Eleanor was thinking that it had been a very long time since she had dressed to look like a stray sunbeam or been so hungry for breakfast, or arisen so aware, so conscious of herself, so deliberate and tender in her attentions. She even brushed her teeth with a niceness she could not remember ever feeling before. It is all the result of a good night's sleep, she thought. Since Mother died, I must have been sleeping even more poorly than I realized. Aren't you ready yet? Coming, coming, Eleanor said and ran to the door, remembered that it was still locked and unlocked it softly. Theodora was waiting for her in the hall, vivid in the dullness in gaudy plaid. Looking at Theodora, it was not possible for Eleanor to believe that she had ever dressed or washed or moved or ate or slept or talked without enjoying every minute of what she was doing. Perhaps Theodora never cared at all what other people thought of her. Do you realise that we may be another hour or so just finding the dining room, Theodora said. But maybe they've left us a map. Did you know that Luke and the doctor have been up for hours? I was talking to them from the window. They have started without me, Eleanor thought. Tomorrow I will wake up earlier and be there to talk from the window too. They came to the foot of the stairs, and Theodora crossed the great dark hall and put her hand confidently to a door. Here, she said, but the door opened into a dim, echoing room neither of them had seen before. Here, Eleanor said, but the door she chose led onto the narrow passage to the little parlour where last night they had sat before a fire. It's across the hall from that... Theodora said, and turned, baffled. Damn it, she said, and put her head back and shouted. Luke! Doctor! Distantly they heard an answering shout, and Theodora moved to open another door. If they think, she said over her shoulder, that they are going to keep me forever in this filthy hall, trying one door after another to get to my breakfast. That's the right one, I think, Anna said, with the dark room to go through, and then the dining room beyond. Theodora shouted again blundered against some light piece of furniture, cursed, and then the door beyond was opened, and the doctor said, "'Good morning.' "'Foul, filthy house,' Theodora said, rubbing her knee. "'Good morning.' "'You will never believe this now, of course,' the doctor said. "'But three minutes ago these doors were wide open. "'We left them open so you could find your way. "'We sat here and watched them swing shut just before you called. "'Well, good morning.' "'Kippers,' Luke said from the table.' "'Good morning. I hope you ladies are the kipper kind.'